Okay, so perhaps before I start, uh, I should warn you that uh, this is going to be a very theoretical paper. It is more of a conceptual um, exploration of the notion of propaganda and its role, the role it plays or could play in the field of critical discourse studies. Um, so contrary to the to the keynote who uh, provided the um, yeah, a lecture uh, stuffed with uh, a lot of examples, a lot of uh, illustrations and concrete case studies. Um, I will restrict myself to this kind of conceptual um, exploration, if you like, eh, uh, in which I will try to answer the question why, um, yeah, why the most discourse analysts do not really use the notion of propaganda on the one hand and why most scholars of propaganda on the other hand do not really uh, make use of uh, techniques, concepts, notions, theories developed in the field of discourse studies. So let me start my um, presentation by pointing out that in recent years uh, there has been something of a renewed interest in the signifier of propaganda in response to uh, the emergence of um, new forms of um, one second new forms uh, of large-scale manipulation via social media, big data, and algorithms. At the same time, we should notice that the term propaganda has never completely disappeared either, eh? even if its popularity has known its, up, its ups and downs in academia and in the public debate in general. In that context, it's useful to refer to um, the work of uh, Michael Sprule, um, who showed that the term disappeared and reappeared in the American public debate and in research time and time again. And at the end of his book, written at the end of the 90s, he points out that much of the American anti-propaganda literature remains remarkably atheoretical, in spite of the fact that the notion is used constantly. As propaganda came to attract attention again and again, for instance, in response to the Vietnam War and the Watergate scandal, and later in response to 9-11, the American line of both progressive and conservative propaganda critique came to be challenged by neo-Marxist and postmodern analyses of culture, class, ideology, and power, of course, in the 80s and in the 90s of last century. In that context, it should be noticed that even the propaganda model of Herman and Chomsky was based quite often on muckraking style analyses of news coverage of American foreign policy and on a critical political economy of the media. It was much less a theoretical reflection on the category of propaganda and its relationship to competing concepts such as ideology, hegemony, subjectivity and discourse. So in itself, uh, this lack of theoretical reflection in propaganda studies is not necessarily problematic. Uh, um, if the goal, at least, is to uncover and problematize specific media practices and manipulations. However, I think things become a bit more problematic if we want to understand concepts and practices of propaganda from a discourse analytical vantage point, when we ask questions about interpretation, intentionality and ideology in mass communication. So in this paper, I will argue that if propaganda as a term eh, is to make sense in critical discourse studies, uh, its relationship to established notions of discourse, reflexivity, ideology and hegemony needs to be reconsidered carefully. Eh? And it's in that context that I argue for a notion of propaganda that comprises democratic and, uh, uh, and anti-democratic attempts to introduce, reproduce or change the articulatory practices and discourses of social groups and networks with at least some degree of reflexivity. So, let me go to the next slide. Um, let us start with a brief exploration of some classic understandings of propaganda in propaganda studies. So, for instance, Edward Bernays famously claims that the advocacy of what we believe in is education and that the advocacy of what we don't believe in is propaganda. Uh, Bernays' democratic relativism, then, expressed in this sentence, still resonates today in the many debates between critics and proponents of conspiracy theories, alternative facts and science in an environment marked by filter bubbles and digitally amplified polarization processes and controversies about fake news and liberal bias. In this context, accusations of propaganda fly back and forth. Many introductions to propaganda studies 
acknowledge the negative connotations of propaganda they acquired over time as the term came to be associated with totalitarian regimes, war efforts, advertising and private interests. Before the advent of the internet and social media, the communication process involved in propaganda was seen as a top-down process controlled by government or corporate interests. Propaganda was and still is often understood as the use of persuasive information to manipulate the target audience into a behavior desired by the propagandists. Now, Bernays, Lipman and Laszlo came to believe in the necessity of propaganda, sharing a similar stimulus response model of communication grounded in psychoanalytic and behaviorist views of the human psyche and behavior. To them, the problem does not lie with propaganda itself, but rather with the ends to which it is put. On the other hand, many critics, it's, it's worth noting that many critics of propaganda work with surprisingly similar definitions, even if they reject the democratic relativism of Bernays and Laszlo. For instance, Jawed and, uh, Jawed and O'Donnell, authors of Propaganda and Persuasion, one of the most popular contemporary academic anti-propaganda textbooks, currently in its seventh edition, define propaganda as follows. They define it as the deliberate systematic attempt to shape perceptions, manipulate cognitions and direct behavior to achieve a response that furthers the desired intent of the propagandists. Now, this definition comes remarkably close to that of Laszlo, who similarly understood propaganda as a linear, directed and systematic effort to trigger desired responses. In contrast to Laszlo, Jowett and O'Donnell prefer to reserve the term for misleading and manipulative forms of communication, though. Only when forms of deception are involved, when audience members are somehow misled, Jowett and O'Donnell label communication processes as propaganda. Otherwise, they prefer the term persuasion. They point out that propaganda can take many forms, including concealment of purpose, concealment of identity of the sender, selective distribution of communication through a control of the information flows. In all, occasion, in all cases, some kind of deception is involved. Other authors with similar normative concepts of propaganda point out that in the digital age, other forms of manipulation have become at least as important. Wanless and Burke, for instance, write that the static format of sender-receiver communications is changing, much like Ikomali did in his presentation. Um, the so-called democratization of information implies an increased ability of average users to produce, alter, disseminate and amplify the spread of persuasive messaging, they write. And in turn, this blurs the previously uh, apparent division between the propagandist on the one hand and the sender and the target audience or the receiver on the other hand. But even if the static sender-receiver sender model is changing in our age of digital media, Wendler and Burke stay close to the model of Jowett and O'Donnell. In the end, they merely add that we are now witnessing an intensification of so-called participatory propaganda that actually tries to co-opt its members to actively engage in the spread of persuasive communications, for instance, by retweeting, by liking, uh, and by spreading propagandistic messages ourselves, sometimes while we are unaware of the fact that we are actually spreading politically designed messages. Wanless and Burke point out that the combined application of various ICTs and behavioral analysis to segment, obfuscate and amplify persuasive messaging will make it extremely difficult for average users to recognize propagandic messaging as such. This creates in turn a kind of pollution of the information environment that may have certain uh, important consequences for political behavior. So, it becomes increasingly clear that the goals of the propagandists are not, are not, and may never have been restricted to mere persuasion and behavioral change. Peter Pomerantsev, for instance, writes that propaganda now operates as a kind of online censorship through noise. So information abundance, not scarcity, has become a key weapon of disinformation. For instance, by massively producing uh, and distributing disinformation, combining alternative narratives, pseudo-realities, duplicitous rhetoric with particles of truth, uh, 
both human and non-human and hybrid actors, such as trolls, bots, sock puppets, cyborgs, logarithms and AIs, uh, systematically create noise, confuse, confusion and doubt for purposes as right as division, unification, legitimation and delegitimation. Distrust in targeted actors, groups and institutions, division, doubt and persuasion um, are at least as important goals for contemporary propagandists as persuasion, behavioral change and censorship. We have therefore come a very long way, not only from the classic democratic relativist definitions of propaganda offered by Lippmann, Bernays and Nassau, but also from the way propaganda was conceptualized by critical authors such as Chomsky and Harriman, who consider propaganda in terms of institutional filters that permit a kind of top-down engineering of consent in the interest of established elites in a capitalist society. Um, so, Jan, yeah? Jan. Oh, you reappeared, you disappeared as a person. We oh. only saw the background for a while, but now you are back. Okay, okay. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, when that happens again, please, please tell me. Yeah? So um, this basically, so um, there is an increased interest in the notion of propaganda, eh? um, but nevertheless, eh, um, yeah, there is still almost no talk about propaganda in the field of critical discourse studies. Eh? And with critical discourse studies, I, I mean both, say, the type of ethics style discourse theory that uh, many of us like to work with, but also CDA, eh, critical discourse analysis, critical linguistics, and so on and so forth. Um, so why is this? Now, in order to find out why there is almost no propaganda in discourse studies and no discourse analysis in propaganda studies either, I think it's useful to start with two observations. Uh, first observation is that most propaganda studies do not engage with theoretically sophisticated notions of ideology, hegemony and discourse. They tend to avoid constructivist, neo-Marxist and post-structuralist frameworks for thinking about reality, truth, manipulation, interests, discourse and power. Even though epistemological and ontological positions of propaganda scholars are often left implicit, most of them seem to work on the basis of positivist and realist assumptions. Second observation has to do with discourse studies. Most authors working within the transdisciplinary field of critical discourse studies do not engage with the concept of propaganda at all. Even if they frequently focus on data and communication processes that perform propaganda functions, they tend to frame their analyses in terms of ideology and hegemony instead, proceeding on the basis of constructivist, critical realist or post-structuralist assumptions. Discourse scholars and students of propaganda tend to move in parallel universes in which different paradigms dominate, even though one could argue that one should not muddy the waters by bringing discourse theory into propaganda studies and vice versa. I think that a confrontation of both perspectives uh, on mass communication could expose some interesting blind spots in both research traditions. Discourse studies developed at least in part in response to naive container concepts of meaning and transmission models of communication. And that goes especially for critical discourse studies that draw on neo-Marxist, post-Marxist, post-structuralist or post-foundational concepts of ideology and hegemony. From such CDS perspectives, classic propaganda studies not only come across as naive or simplistic in their intentional conception of meaning and in their linear notions of influence, they also seem to ignore the way ideologies can develop organically and how discursive possibilities are historically and structurally overdetermined. Propaganda studies also pose challenges for discourse scholars though, because the CDS tendency to think about ideology and hegemony as a kind of Gramscian common sense that allows us to leave the political nature of our reality in the background makes it difficult to analyze communication practices of very reflexive actors. It is therefore important to recognize that a great deal of ideological discourse that has become hegemonic in our day and age was at some point at least developed and distributed by actors who were very much aware of what they were doing, or at least at a very high degree of reflexive awareness about it. So the highly reflexive discursive practices of propagandists, both in the past and today, 
can destabilize CDS notions of meaning as something that can only come across, uh, can come about in open-ended but structured processes of enunciation and articulation that transcend conscious thought and action. From a CDS perspective, meaning cannot originate or be determined by any single propagandist. And even if that may be true, it is equally true that societal discourses are at least in part shaped by actors who are aware of what they are doing when they attempt to reshape the discursive practices and communication environments that constitute our societies. I think therefore that a, um, that a rapprochement, a kind of um, um, yeah, uh, uh, coming together of propaganda and discourse studies is possible on the condition that propaganda scholars will take a step back from naive container notions of meaning and transmission models of communication on the one hand, and on condition that critical discourse scholars start to take the reflexive properties and capacities of social actors and discourses more seriously. Thus far, though, the mutual disinterest between both groups of scholars has almost been complete. In order to deal with the above mentioned tensions, most propaganda oriented authors have opted not to engage with concepts of ideology and hegemony at all, to the extent that they are familiar with them in the first place. And critical discourse scholars have returned the favor uh, by dismissing propaganda as an irrelevant object of inquiry already covered by their own concepts and methods. Now, I think that in order to understand this mutual lack of interest better, we should take a look at two rare examples of CDS authors who did make use of the category of propaganda. So, we could, for instance, refer to the work of John Oddo. He is the author of the, a book called The Discourse on Propaganda, and he explicitly problematizes the classic rece sender-receiver model of communication and the issue of intentionality in classic approaches to propaganda. Instead, he proposes to see propaganda as a kind of distributed activity, a kind of dialogical process that is never only the work of a single centralized actor disseminating content in every direction. He also points out that propaganda only truly succeeds if it changes hands. It must travel from one source and one context to another, shifting its meanings along the way. For this reason, he prefers terms such as recontextualization and mass recontextualization that he takes from the, the ethnographers Bauman and Briggs, uh, um, which better capture, according to him, how propaganda is borrowed, reused and recycled. He argues that successful propaganda is therefore always marked by very high degrees of intertextuality. Although then is a rare example of a critical discourse analyst who actively reflects on and uses the term propaganda. But at the same time, like many classic and new propaganda scholars, he drops almost every reference to notions of ideology and hegemony. Um, for Otto, as well as for many other uh, propaganda scholars, propaganda is about manipulation. He writes that he doesn't think that we can or should purge the word of its negative associations. He follows Stanley in arguing that uh, democratic forms of uh, persuasion and so on should be called uh, civic rhetoric and that one should not use the term propaganda for democratic forms of political communication. While a distinction between propaganda and civic rhetoric can be defended on normative grounds, I think this distinction can only make sense be because Otto does not work with any explicit notion of ideology or hegemony. Um, it seems then that merely using the concept of propaganda, even a discourse analytical notion of propaganda, goes at the expense of notions such as ideology and hegemony. Um, in the field of post-structural discourse theory, we find a second example of someone who does use the notion of propaganda in CDS. Uh, Dimitar Vatsov eh, is a rare example of an author that does take the notion of propaganda seriously without ab abandoning his uh, Essex-inspired assumptions. Vatsov proposes uh, the term populist propaganda discursive front in order to conceptualize propaganda as a kind of uh, global articulatory practice that creates a kind of populism from above via what he calls strategically reinforced bullshitting. Um, 
um, that blurs the meanings between statements and that makes signifiers and statements utterly ex exchangeable and arbitrary. He argues that successful propaganda today, uh, especially uh, the, the kind of populist right-wing propaganda that we see across authoritarian uh, political projects across the globe, um, uh, creates a discursive um, uh, horizon where it is always possible to say one thing instead of another without any requirement for strict coherence, which explains, for instance, Trump's tweets. Propaganda thus creates a discursive horizon where Laclauian empty signifiers multiply. To put it in Pomerantsev's words, it creates the impression that nothing is true and everything's possible. So, um, even though I don't think that Vatsov's take on propaganda covers all possible types of propaganda, his work constitutes the most impressive discourse theoretical effort to think propaganda I encountered to this date eh, in the field of Essex style discourse theory. Nevertheless, my own discourse theoretical take on propaganda differs in a number of ways. Um, my notion of propaganda is not reserved exclusively for elite attempts to usurp the popular will, um, so not exclusively for this kind of top-down propaganda. I prefer a less normative notion of propaganda that encompasses the possibility of these reflexive attempts to discursively disarticulate both democratic and anti-democratic ideologies and hegemonic projects. In this sense, I follow Jonas Stahl, who considers uh, propaganda to be a performance of power, something that has to be thought of in a plural, in the sense of propagandas, eh, in a plural sense. Um, Stahl argues that propaganda is aimed not only at communicating a message, but at constructing reality itself. He argues that successful propaganda comes to operate on a micro scale as it becomes an integral part of our daily practices and conversations and a kind of Foucauldian uh, uh, microphysics of power. Uh, practiced at a macro level, it may also enable large scale transformations such as toppling governments, uh, but also establishing mass surveillance and instigating global warfare. Yep. Now, Stahl are, distinguishes between elite and popular propaganda but argues that both are involved in the propaganda art of world making. He points out that radical democratic, participatory, anti-racist and anti-colonial movements just as much develop and aspire to forms of power that may call new worlds into being. Propaganda is not the sole property of far-right populist projects. Um, now, to conclude, uh, I retain Stahl's refusal to reserve the term propaganda for the machinations that benefit elites, but at the same time, I'm wary of his implicit suggestion that popular propaganda is necessarily a democratic force that demands a democratization. Yeah. Unfortunately, Stahl uh, also uses the prop term propaganda at the expense of notions such as ideology and hegemony, which he does not elaborate on. So this brings me to my conclusion. Um, inspired by post-structuralist discourse theory, I argue for the following notion of propaganda. The term propaganda for me uh, refers to those multimodal language games uh, where social groups, organizations and or networks um, perform discursive practices that introduce, reproduce or change articulatory practices and discourses with varying degrees of reflexivity. So it's a non-normative uh, definition of propaganda grounded in a concept of discourse as a practice of articulation, which does not force us to drop notions of ideology and hegemony. We can retain the idea that discursive propaganda practices can be informed by or aim to reinforce particular ideologies in the context of struggles for hegemony. Propagandas, in the plural then, remain forms of power, but forms of power that are not necessarily democratic or undemocratic. Neither is propaganda a communication process whereby all actors who play a role in it have to be aware of it to the same degree. It allows for the above mentioned uh, rapprochement between propaganda and discourse studies, as it does not involve container concepts of meaning or transmission models of communication and requires us to take the reflexive properties and capacities of social actors seriously while avoiding the traps of both individualism and structuralism. Thank you very much.